So we're going to move right into our, our next session, which is focused on biofuels and processing. And we have both speakers will, will be joining us uh, virtually. Uh, our, our first speaker is uh, Chris Verve, who is the uh, executive director of the Canadian Oilseed Processors Association. And uh, Chris will be talking about the renewable fuel demand in North America and the opportunities for Crush. I hope that uh, Chris is queued up and ready to go. I'll just wait at the podium until we have them ready. Hi, Clint, can you hear me? Loud and clear, it's all yours, Chris. Great. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the invitation to participate once again uh, at this year's Canola Week. So I will be speaking uh, to a handful of slides on the subject of renewable fuels and crushed expansion. I've been speaking about this issue at Canola Week, I think now for the last three years, um, with a lot of potential, with a lot of hope, uh, but I'm glad to give a presentation this year that um, really does demonstrate some of the progress that we've seen as it relates to renewable fuels and crush expansion. So just a quick overview, a 101, if you will, on renewable fuels. So GHD emission reductions from transportation is a priority for governments. And it's really a priority for governments around the world. Uh, but my presentation is going to really focus on the priorities of emission reductions from transportation in Canada and in the United States. And renewable fuels um, are a proven and viable solution to decarbonize transportation fuels. So transportation fuels in Canada, the U.S., and, and really globally uh, account for about a quarter of all GHG emissions. So a very significant footprint in terms of carbon emissions from transportation fuels and renewable fuels are definitely part of that solution. And why they're part of that solution, especially renewable fuels from crops like canola, is that they do have a lower carbon footprint. And some of the analysis out there for canola specifically, for example, does show that the carbon footprint can be 90% lower. And when we talk about a footprint that is lower by up to 90%, I just want to turn everybody's attention to the graphic on the right hand side of the slide. So essentially what we see at the top of that continuous circle is the canola plant, for example, and it's sequestering or sorry, it's taking carbon out of the air as part of the photosynthesis and then sequestering a lot of that carbon into the soil. That canola, the oil that's produced from canola is then transformed into a biofuel, which is then used by heavy transportation, such as trucks and other equipment, which of course releases CO2 into the air but then again, sucked back out of the atmosphere by canola. So it's really that continuous circle process that makes uh, the fuels produced from crops like canola renewable. The main two fuels in the marketplace today that do use canola are biodiesel and renewable diesel. I'll be talking a lot about biodiesel and renewable diesel in subsequent slides. And I just wanna make a quick distinction between the two products. I think many people are familiar with the term biodiesel, uh, but less are familiar with renewable diesel. They are two distinct products. They do use the same feedstock to produce, but they are different in the sense of how they are produced. So, bio so biodiesel is produced in a manner that uh, requires blending of fuels, and there's limitations to how much biodiesel can be blended with conventional fossil diesel. Renewable diesel uses a process that essentially produces a product at the end that is uh, chemically identical to fossil diesel, and it can be used interchangeably with fossil diesel. And I think Jim said it quite rightly in his opening presentation, <clears throat> it can be used 100% in terms of a replacement to fossil diesel. But what makes renewable fuels tick? And really what it's all about is policy and regulations. So if we, we need government policy and regulations to make renewable fuels viable. The key policies and regulations and incentives, and I won't go through all of them because there are a lot of them, but the main ones that I want to cover here are uh, number one, national and subnational blending mandates. So these are mandates set by government that prescribe minimum blending and usage of biofuels with fossil fuels. Uh, so we have these both in Canada and the United States. 
But what's really coming online in a bigger way over the last number of years are national and subnational low carbon fuel standards. And these should not be mixed up with mandates. There is a mandate attached to low carbon fuel standard, but it is not uh, something that would prescribe the amount of biofuels that need to be used. What it does mandate is that fossil fuels like diesel need to reduce the carbon intensities by a prescribed amount. There's also a myriad of other incentives that help support the biofuels or renewable fuels in, in Canada and around the world. Um, national and subnational tax credits is one example. There's also government funding for production and distribution infrastructure. And again, I'm just touching on a couple of these, but the key takeaway from this slide is these are basically the, like the main three components of what uh, drives demand for biofuels in North America. So we do have a track record of success in Canada and the United States in terms of those different policies and incentives driving demand. So this is just illustrative in nature, just to give folks a snapshot of what the demand and production of biofuels has been over the last decade in Canada and the US due to some of those uh, policies that I just mentioned on the previous slide. So pretty humble beginnings back in 2011, where we see in Canada and the US renewable and biodiesel production at only 1.4 billion liters to 2021, where we're now north of 9 billion liters of production. And really ditto on the consumption or the demand side of the equation, where we started at around 4 billion liters in 2011, to north of 11 billion liters of 20 uh, by 2021. So there is a lot of success uh, due to the policies that have been implemented over the years. But what does it look like going forward? And this is just a demand scenario. It's estimates that we've taken from different sources and tried to paint a picture of what could be possible down the road as it relates to both biodiesel and renewable diesel demand in the United States and Canada. And it really, again, is all about policies, regulations, and incentives, and how they are evolving in time. Um, so just quickly in terms of some of the key policies that we see coming down the pike and being implemented over the, na uh, uh, the next decade or so. In Canada, we have the federal low carbon fuel standard. Again, this is a regulation uh, that will mandate a lower carbon intensity for the fossil fuels that are uh, sold and, and used in Canada. So the federal LCFS, better known as the Clean Fuel Regulation, mandates a 15% lower carbon intensity by 2030. We have provincial programs in Canada. There's a provincial low carbon fuel standard, in fact, that's been in place for the last 10 years in British Columbia. And they are proposing a 30% carbon intensity reduction by 2030. In Quebec, uh, over this past year, they have approved a 10% blending mandate by 2030. So currently, uh, Quebec, or previously, sorry, Quebec did not have any type of biofuel blending policy, but uh, earlier this year, they approved a blending mandate of 10% by 2030. In the United States, uh, we have something called the Renewable Fuel Standard, and the next speaker will be talking a little bit more about that program, but that does mandate uh, volume requirements to be blended into conventional diesel fuels and, and, and gasoline. Uh, so that continues to evolve uh, moving forward. We have low carbon fuel standards in the United States. So California is the biggest market, the most well-known market for biofuels as it relates to the low carbon fuel standard. They're currently noodling on some changes to their program, so a 30 to 35% carbon intensity reduction by 2030. Oregon also has a low carbon fuel standard. Um, they just finalized an update to their program that is going to require 37% carbon intensity reduction by 2035. And Washington also very recently released its final regulation for its low carbon fuel standard, which does require a 20% reduction by 2034. Last but not least in the United States, we have tax credits that have been recently announced as part of the Inflation Reduction Act that does set blending and production tax credits out to 2027. 
So that's a mouthful. Uh, the point I want people to take away from this slide is that there are a lot of different biofuel or renewable fuel policies that are driving demand going forward over the next decade or so. And again, we've attempted to take a stab here at what that might mean in terms of biodiesel and renewable diesel demand. So again, on the right-hand side, uh, there's certainly a possibility that we see the demand grow from 11 billion liters today to maybe 17 billion liters by 2030. So what has been the response uh, to some of these policies and regulations that are coming down the pike? This chart shows the expansion of renewable diesel in uh, North America. So the brown represents the existing capacity of renewable diesel and the green represents the capacity that's either uh, under construction or has been announced out to 2027. So really unbelievable supply response from industry players as it relates to renewable diesel production capacity. Uh, just as little as two years ago, again, very humble beginnings at two and a half billion liters of production capacity. You fast forward only a couple of years, and this year that's already um, you know, roughly tripled uh, where we see it now at 7.6 uh, billion liters. And if all of the announcements um, and the construction does come to fruition out to 2027, we could see um, the capacity grow to 23 billion liters. So really an unprecedented uh, supply response from industry as it relates to meeting some of the demand that we see coming down the pike over the next decade or so. So why is this of interest to canola? Why is this of interest to the crush community? It is that canola oil or that soybean oil that ultimately is uh, used for some of the renewable fuel production in both Canada and the United States. And there has definitely been a supply response from the crush community as well. Again, there's a direct link between all the dots that you see on the map in front of you uh, with the RD or the renewable diesel expansion that I explained on the previous slide. And what's even more interesting is that we see the energy companies. So Philips 66, Marathon, Chevron, Federated Co-op here in Canada are partnering with grain companies to help uh, build out this crush capacity. So for canola crush, in terms of possible capacity growth in the years to come, uh, we could see almost 6 million metric tons of increased capacity based on the uh, facilities that are either under construction today or that have been announced. So that is a significant uh, growth from the current level of capacity, a 50% increase, in fact. In the U.S., it's really very much a similar story. Again, lots of dots there on the map that pepper the Midwest, and we see U.S. soy crush capacity growing by perhaps as much as 15 million metric tons in the coming years, which would be a 25% increase from current crush capacity. So this is a busy slide, uh, but again, what I would like folks to take away from this is um, basically the question that I always get asked, uh, is it possible for canola to keep pace with this growing demand for renewable fuels? And the short answer is we think so. Um, so again, this chart is a little bit busy, but when you look at what the canola production could be over the next decade, again, this is both Canada and the US, uh, we see the potential uh, certainly for approximately 29, 30 million metric tons of production uh, for canola in both Canada and the U.S. And that's a combination of increased yields. Again, I think Jim Everson said it quite right at the beginning of uh, the uh, of the Canola Week presentations. Um, we do see a lot of opportunities for productivity gains, but there's also some room for opportunities in acreage expansion in places uh, like the brown soil zones of Canada, for example. So again, we have a high degree of, of optimism that we're going to continue to see canola production grow in North America. Um, and as I showed on some of the previous slides, renewable fuels and the demand for renewable fuels is going to grow as well. And we've taken a stab at trying to estimate, well, what does that exactly mean for canola? So currently about 2 million tons of canola seed uh, do get used in the biofuel markets in both Canada and the U.S., 
And by 2030, we estimate that about 6.5 million tons of seed could be used for biofuels by that time. So 9% of our seed is used for biofuels today, give or take. Um, and you fast forward about eight years or 10 years, we see maybe 23% or about a quarter of the canola used in biofuels. So again, we think that there's lots of room to grow production uh, and it will keep pace with the growing demand for canola used in biofuels and the rest of the canola will likely still be used in some of the traditional markets such as food and feed. Last slide just to help spur some discussion and some questions and to summarize some of the ground that I covered here over the last 10 minutes. Again, the key takeaway, demand for renewable fuels is increasing. It's all about government policy and politics, which are the key drivers. It has been a catalyst for new crash investments and increasing canola demand. But as I just said, demand from non-fuel markets, such as food and feed, will likely continue to dominate. So as much as 75% of the canola that's produced out to 2030 will still find a way into those traditional markets. Growing canola supplies and improving productivity is really critical to match the demand. And again, here's just some bullet points for discussion purposes. So higher yields are the primary focus. So that could be done through improved varieties, increased fertilizer efficiency. Um, as I mentioned, there's some possibility for expansion of canola acres. So brown soil zones was already mentioned, but there's also perhaps some opportunity to increase acreage of winter varieties in the United States. And lastly, and again, this is just to spur some conversation, uh, varieties with higher oil content could also be a solution. So when we talk about crush, and certainly when we talk about canola crush, it's, it's all about the oil. I mean, meal is a very important component, and a colleague of mine will speak to how important canola meal is. But oil content is, is something that is interesting, uh, because if we can increase the, the amount of oil content per acre, that's another way to increase productivity. So that's my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions at the end. Please join me in thanking uh, Chris. Thank you very much. And and we will have uh, some, uh, question, uh, time for questions here uh, just after our next speaker, who is uh, Chris Ramig from the uh, U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, he'll be talking on uh, canola-based fuels and the U.S. Renewable Fuel Standard. standard. Um, please join. I'm um, hoping that uh, Chris is queued up already. All right, uh, Chris Ramig, if you can hear me, you uh, are free to go. Super. Can you all hear me okay? Loud and clear. Yep, go ahead. Wonderful. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm very aware that I'm standing between you all and your break, so I'll do best to make my remarks on the briefer side. Um, but I'm here today to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, the U.S. Renewable Fuel Standard Program, which uh, when, when other Chris was talking a moment ago and he was talking about the U.S. mandates, what he was talking about is the U.S. Renewable Fuel Standard Program that my office runs. Uh, and I'm here to share with you some, uh, some I think, fairly exciting new developments related to canola-based fuels that have happened uh, really just within the last week for this program. Uh, so let's see if I can advance my slides. There we are. All right, so we're gonna start off very briefly with a little bit of context for you all, because I know not everyone here are renewable fuels experts. Um, just a couple of details about uh, the Clean Air Act and the Renewable Fuel Standard Program uh, to get you situated with the basics. We'll talk a little bit about uh, something called RFS fuel pathways and life cycle analysis, which is critical to the recent actions that have uh, been taken related to canola. And then we'll talk a little bit about the historical and the recent actions on these fuels under the program. So very quickly, I won't go through a whole lot on this slide, but I think what you really need to know is that there's this thing called the Clean Air Act in the United States. And my office, the Office of Transportation and Air Quality is responsible for implementing the vehicle and fuel programs under that law. Uh, specifically for those who are interested, that's section 211 of the Clean Air Act that gives us the authority to regulate fuels. And uh, there are many parts of section 211, but the one that's critical for today is section 211 which established the Renewable Fuel Standard Program um, and, and created these, uh, what are congressional mandates that we uh, must implement um, on behalf of the American public. Um, there are some examples here of, of fuel regulations that we've done over the past 40 plus years uh, in existence as at EPA uh, under the fuel programs, but the big one that's uh, important to you all today is the RFS program. So a little bit about the RFS program. Um, as Chris sort of described, 
essentially the RFS program is a series of mandates. Um, the statute directs us to uh, implement this in consultation with our Department of Agriculture and Department of Energy. There's been two versions of the program over the years. The first was RFS 1, which came to be in 2007. And then the current incarnation of the program, which is RFS 2, came about in 2010. And these provisions, the, uh, the, the RFS provisions, require that certain quantities of uh, renewable fuels be blended into transportation fuel, primarily gasoline and diesel. And currently, uh, as we implement this program, one of the big things that we do is put in place rulemakings um, that set the standards for what those volumes of fuel that have to get blended into uh, gasoline and diesel every year are. Um, we've got a lot of other activities underway, but uh, the biggest one that's important for, for my talk and for you all is that we have an ongoing approval process to bring new renewable fuels into the program as they enter the marketplace. And part, a big part of that process is conducting life cycle greenhouse gas assessments of those renewable fuels. Now, why life cycle assessment? Well, it's because that's how Congress wrote the law. Uh, you can see on this slide that there are uh, a few major categories of renewable fuels. Each of these categories, EPA sets uh, specific uh, minimum volume thresholds for when we issue new regulations. Um, and all renewable fuels that are produced under the program fall into one of these categories that you see listed. And you can see here on the slide that these categories are, are, def are each defined by a percentage reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And that percentage reduction is relative to the petroleum fuel that we're placing, that, it's, that that fuel is replacing, excuse me. Uh, so that's generally either uh, gasoline or, you know, or relative to diesel fuel um, in the case of most canola-based fuels. And as part of, uh, our, of looking at uh, new potential fuels that could be brought into the program, we have to look at how they perform and um, how, uh, what their green greenhouse gas production, uh, reduction potential is relative to gasoline diesel and whether it meets one or more of these thresholds that you're seeing on this slide. So just to give a little bit more detail, what we're talking about when we talk about bringing a new fuel into the program, we're talking about a few, what's called a fuel pathway. And a fuel pathway has three essential characteristics. Uh, it involves a feedstock, for example, canola oil. It involves a production process. Chris talked about a couple of those. Uh, one is the biodiesel production process, which is called transesterification, uh, and the renewable diesel production process, which is primarily uh, a process called hydro treating. Um, and then the third component is the finished fuel itself, uh, which could be something like biodiesel, renewable diesel, jet fuel, ethanol, and so on. Uh, every, every fuel that's brought into the program can, you know, has these three essential characteristics. So what does it look like when we do one of these analyses to look at the potential for bringing in a new fuel? Uh, this is a schematic showing what EPA's life cycle greenhouse gas analysis uh, methodology looks like. Uh, we look at everything from the feedstock production process, including, including things like the fertilizer and other energy inputs required to uh, produce uh, the feedstock, uh, the emissions required to uh, transport it to a fuel production facility, all of the energy inputs and outputs that are involved uh, in processing the feedstock into fuel at that facility, uh, the emissions associated with trucking that fuel to uh, the, the station where it's ultimately or the blending facility or the station where it's ultimately uh, going to be put into the fuel supply and the emissions associated with actually using the fuel. So getting on to the good stuff. Uh, canola pathways under the RFS program have been around for a long time, uh, since 2010, in fact, uh, so very close to the beginning of the program. So in 2010, EPA approved biodiesel produced from canola or rapeseed oil via transesterification to produce uh, what are called RINs, the, which are the compliance credits, or if you will, the currency of the program. Um, much more recently, uh, in March of 2020, the U.S. Canola Association uh, submitted a petition requesting that uh, biomass-based diesel and advanced biofuel credits uh, be uh, allowed for additional fuel types produced from canola oil. And those additional fuel types were renewable diesel, jet fuel, naphtha, and liquid propane gas produced from canola oil through a hydrogen process. Very recently, November 30th, uh, so just last week, the EPA administrator signed a final rulemaking that approved these pathways and added them to our regulations. And that uh, rulemaking, I'm happy to say, was officially published in our federal register uh, just last Friday, December 2nd. 
This is just a quick summary of the uh, important information that was in that determination. So I said before that uh, a key piece of this is uh, for us in approving new fuels is determining their percent greenhouse gas reduction relative to the petroleum fuels that they're uh, replacing. And you can see here uh, what we found. We can we found that, um, and you know the essential information here is that to uh, to get into the biomass-based diesel and advanced biofuel pools that the U.S. Canola Association was requesting, you need to get to at least a 50% reduction. And you can see here that all four of the fuels that we evaluated, renewable diesel, naphtha, liquid propane gas, and jet fuel, all met that threshold um, and actually exceeded it. Um, the, for renewable diesel and jet fuel, we did a little bit more in-depth analysis, so we put some error bars around uh, those numbers, um, but you can still see that um, all of these fuels are meeting that 50% threshold. Now, under the RFS, unlike uh, low carbon fuel standards in Canada and California and some other places, uh, you don't get extra credit for beating the threshold by more. Um, that's just the way Congress wrote the law for us and nothing we can really do about that. Um, however, you know, we are the EPA. We, uh, we do like to see additional greenhouse gas reductions and we like to encourage uh, pathways and actions that, uh, do, that do a good job at reducing greenhouse gas emissions by more than the threshold. This is uh, just a slide to show you briefly um, what actually changed in our regulations. Uh, there's a citation to the regulation there if anyone is interested to go and actually have a look at it. Uh, this just uh, uh, shows you uh, what, what from a legal standpoint was added when we uh, finalized these pathways last week. And that's really all I wanted to make sure and present to you all. Uh, these are some resources for interested stakeholders. I'm happy to share my slides after the presentation so that you can make use of these. Um, but if there are any folks out there who are uh, interested to register a company or a facility uh, to produce uh, uh, these fuels from canola oil, uh, these links will give you the information you need to get started with that. Um, and also down at the bottom is uh, some information for our, our help desk if you have any questions or need any assistance in that process. So with that, I'll just say thank you, and I look forward to any questions y'all might have. Well, thank you, Chris. And uh, if I can get uh, Chris Vervey joining us back as well, so we'll have both Chris's available for a quick um, q and A. I, I think we'll we'll keep this just to five minutes, so we have time for for one or, or two questions from the audience. But I think that uh, both have. Uh, have have uh, given us a good example of, of how exciting uh, the the future looks for for both canola and, and biodiesel. Do we have any questions from the floor or or anything online? Nothing online, Jay. Anything from the floor? Oh, uh, Raymond Gadwa has a question. Can we get a mic over to him? Um, I do, with respect to renewable fuels and uh, and uh, the consumption of canola oil by the general consumer, how do you address concerns about food inflation and the use of canola oil and other other soy oil, what have you, with respect to to the the extra demand that that's going to put on the on the food side and the consumer side, and and what element? What effect does that have on political decisions regarding the use of uh, renewable fuels? Chris, you want to talk about that from sort of the, the oil production and consumption side? I think that was more on your slides. Yeah, sure. And it's a good question. And it's a question that we get a lot. Uh, so thanks for that, Raymond. Um, the way that we characterize it is, is very much food and fuel. And I, I hope that the last slide or one of the last slides that I presented gives everybody in the audience that impression that you know, food and feed is really going to continue to be the primary market for canola going forward. At least that's how we see it. Um, there's certainly an opportunity. Uh, we do see a lot of growth potential for canola usage in biofuels. It's going to be a good news story as things evolve from our perspective when we see more value-added crush, more jobs, um, more predictable markets for our farmers. There's a host of reasons why, uh, why we're pursuing these opportunities. But again, at the end of the day, uh, when you look out to 2030, for example, we still see 75% of what we're producing uh, canola-wise in U.S. and Canada to be directed towards the food and feed market. And I'll just add briefly that you know we did look at um, the 
shifting between different uses of canola oil as part of our analysis. And we didn't really uh, see in our, in our work um, uh, much indication there would be shifting from food markets uh, to supply additional biofuel demand. And um, we also received some comments in our rulemaking process um, that brought up some similar questions to, to what the gentleman just asked. And you know, we, we considered that very carefully. And when we looked at it, um, it seemed that you know, on the timeline that new crush capacity and new renewable fuel production capacity could be built to uh, increase that demand, um, we didn't find a whole lot of evidence that there would be uh, any sort of you know, severe competition um, that would that would press food consumers. And if you want to read more about that, it's all in the, the documents associated with uh, the, the rulemaking that I linked in my presentation. Thank you, Chris. Um, any other questions from the floor? Seeing nothing else, well, I'm hoping that we can get us a little bit closer to, to back on time. Um, I, I want to thank uh, all of the speakers that we've had in, in both sessions here, here this morning uh, for uh, really great presentations and, and thank you all as well for, for, the, um, for the questions. Uh, in lieu of, of speaker gifts, uh, like we have in, in previous years, uh, we'll be making a donation to the Keith Downey Undergraduate Scholarship at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, but we will take a break now for, for coffee. I'm going to make an executive decision. Why don't we start back at 11.05, so five minutes, uh, a little bit later than, than what, but then it gives us 20 minutes for a little bit of networking. And again, would encourage everyone to, that if you do have some further questions, you want to continue this conversation with our great speakers, please uh, submit them online or catch them at coffee. All right. Have a great break.